Hi guys, Tim Melvin here. How is everybody today? It's Friday, March 18th. <clears throat> um, St. Patrick's Day is now in the rearview window. You know, 20 years from now, 20 years ago, probably wouldn't look as chipper today as I do. But um, yeah, it was stay at home night. We don't go out into all that madness and mess anymore. Though I did make a killer corned beef and cabbage for dinner yesterday. Anyway, the the stories of the week didn't really change much. It's still the war in Russia, and we're still hearing ridiculous. Ridiculous talk about positive talks between Russia and Ukraine. There's no positive talks, guys. Putin reaffirmed his conditions uh, to end hostilities. And these are things that Ukraine has simply said they cannot accept. There's four major points, um, which are, you know, quit resisting, change the Constitution to reflect neutrality with no leaning towards the West or intention of combining with or even talking to NATO. Um, the other thing was to admit that Russia owns Crimea. Ukraine has no intention of admitting that. And granting independence to two eastern provinces and recognize them as an independent state, which, of course, they would then immediately turn towards and become a part of Russia. I don't think that's going to fly in Ukraine. I think this war is going to drag on far longer than any of us want to see. Um, China and Joe Biden, you know, China's Xi Jinping and Joe Biden talked today, really unknown exactly what came out of that, but we know Biden was going to warn him of the cost, warn him of the costs of arming Russia. And I'm pretty sure that Xi Jinping's reply was hmm, not fit for a uh, for a family video like we're shooting here today. I don't think he really cares what Joe Biden thinks. They're making the point for some time that China has lost most, if not all, of its fear of the United States of America. That's eventually going to play out in uh, international relations. I think China's real goal this time, they'll support Russia with, uh, with supplies and some other things. They want no part of being in the shooting. They're going to stick around and watch how all this plays out. If Russia wins and the West doesn't take no steps, that puts Taiwan in play in a very big way. But that's a discussion we'll have when we actually get to that. And I hope you know that's really a really long way down the road. Uh, the other big news, of course, is you know inflation is still with us. The Fed met in Washington D.C. and they raised uh, interest rates by 25 basis points. Two members of the Fed, uh, one is on the Open Market Committee, James uh, James Bullard of St. Louis, and then Christopher Walker, who's also a Fed governor, really wanted to see 50 basis points and, and thought that the data demanded 50 basis points. But Powell and the rest of the committee, before the war started, I think they would have been inclined to go 50 basis points because inflation is running at 40-year highs. Um, but I think with you know geopolitical uh, issues in play. I think they wanted to strike a more cautious balance, and they only went 25 basis points. However, when you look at the dot projections and uh, some of the Fed's economic projections, we're looking for six more hikes this year, possibly as many as three next year. Uh, they did raise their uh, economic growth estimates for 2023, not by much, but by a little bit. They raised them, and they're saying that inflation is not going to get under 3% before um, 2024 at the soonest, won't get back to the 2% level until after that. So the Fed's project inflation is going to hang around a little while, and that is bringing out fears and predictions of stagflation with Goldman Sachs and some of their economists being the, you know, the latest to jump into the fray, warning that they think stag stagflation is already here, it's going to stay with us. That is a disaster for traditional investing, guys. You've got inflation means higher interest rates, which means a you know, fairly steep decline in bond prices, and the lower growth uh, that would be bought on by stagflation would be horrible for most stock prices as it uh, would lead to lower earnings growth across big sections of the United States economy. Fortunately, it would continue to play very well for most of the banking industry because you'd have a couple things going on here that would be like super positive. Stagflation would actually be great for us as bank investors. You've got higher interest rates. That's higher net interest margins on the business that you are doing, higher yields on securities. But you've got slower economic activity, which is going to accelerate the, per, the, the pace, I'm sorry, of M&A activity uh, as 
banks look to buy growth because that'll be the only way to really come across the type of growth that makes your shareholders happy. The rest of the world hates the idea of stagflation. We're not excited about it because I lived through it back in the 70s, but we're not going to make any portfolio decisions because of it, because we actually think it'll be really favorable if it does come to pass for most of the small banks that we own. Now, today, I want to bring you an idea, and I think I've talked to you guys about this in print at least on several times. And, and you know, we have banks, B-A-N-X, uh, the Stone Castle uh, fund in our portfolio that you know invest in bank preferred stocks and debt. And it's done really well for us, kicking out fat dividends. Well, there's another one out there uh, that's Angel Oaks Financial Strategies Fund. The symbol is F-I-N-S, okay, FINS. Um, they primarily invest in bank subordinated debt, which a lot of smaller community banks will raise capital using the subordinated debt. And it's a preferred access a method of raising capital, actually, because it can be counted as tier one capital. We'll spare you all the mechanics. We only have so much time here today of how that works. But banks like to use it. To having more tier one capital is a very good thing. So. Quite often, when they need to raise funds, they'll go to the subordinated debt market. You and I, and I don't care how much money we have, we can call our broker and say, you know what? I saw this little bank out there in Texas is going to do a subordinated debt offering, and it's going to be really attractive, and I want in. And the answer is going to be no, <laughs> because it's a very specialized institutional kind of market for this stuff. Most of us are never going to be able to obtain access to making investments in this very lucrative and, in my opinion, very safe corner of the financial markets. This closed-end fund now allows us to do that. Uh, I have interviewed the managers at uh, AngelX Financial Strategies on a few occasions. These people are super smart, very sharp. They know the banking sector and the banking debt, debt sector about as well as anybody on the planet. So this is going to give us access to an institutional market that we normally can't access at all with very high yields with what I think is a very high margin of safety. Best of all, right now in a yield starved world, it's yielding 8.1%. Here's something else really cool about it. Because it is uh, a very institutional market and most of the buyers our owners. There's not a lot of trading in these, okay? They tend to buy them and hold them to maturity, which are usually fairly short. Uh, you know, five years or so is, has, you know, been among the usual length of time that I see, some longer. But so they're not trading, which means they're not getting marked to market, which means this fund and the securities that it owns, owns have historically not been sensitive to changes in interest rates. Uh, Angel Oaks provided some data one time that showed what's happened to bank subordinated debt during periods of rising interest rates. And the answer is not much at all. So we've got a fairly low risk, low volatility situation kicking off 8.1%. Those of you that are investing for income, you need to get in on that. You need to get in on that today. The other thing that we should all be doing, in addition to our bank, you know, kind of more takeover, small cap oriented portfolio that we run in banking on profits, we need to be looking at those low PE, high yield community bank stocks. Stocks like, and I know we've talked about New York Community Bank, NYCB, on numerous occasions, nine times earnings, 6.1% dividend yield. Um, they're a multifamily lender in the New York City area, and they do a tremendous job uh, of doing so. They have a um, non-performing assets rate of just 0.06%. This is a very nice bank. It's been around for a while. They just closed on a decent size acquisition, kicking off a 6.1% dividend yield. They've been pretty generous about you know increasing that payout over the years. I think that's a low volatility stock that's really going to benefit from higher interest rates and can kind of help offset what might be going on in some of your other more growth oriented accounts if you have such things in your possession. Uh, Northwest Bank Shares, I know we've talked about that one. NWBI in Western Pennsylvania, you've got a 5.72% dividend yield, 11 PE, kind of fairly diversified uh, uh, loan portfolio across several different asset classes, about 1% non-performing assets. So again, doing a solid job, 170 branches, 14 billion in assets. Guys, these guys are right on the edge the Marcellus Shale. They have some branches 
in the Marcellus Shale towns. They will benefit from increased activity um, and drilling and fracking in the Marcellus Shale field as natural gas prices continue to stay at very high levels. And that's gonna, it's gonna ramp up the pace of drilling and economic activity in that region should be pretty good for the bank. Then we have um, Midland States Bank Corp. I really like this little bank, MSBI. They're out in Illinois. Most of the branches are up in the Chicago area. They've got 58 branches, but they have several branches, whole string of branches down at the very Southern end of the state, kind of nothing in the middle there, but um, it's eight, Price to earnings ratio, 3.78% yield, really, you know, kind of a leaning towards being a business bank, some commercial real estate, commercial and industrial, and they do a fair amount of equipment finance lending too in the region. So a little higher yielding uh, business than the traditional one to four family uh, mortgage lenders. Um, but you know, these guys have been around, all right? And James Garfield was the president when this bank was formed back in 1881. So they've been through some recessions and wars and depressions, and then they're still here. So I think there's an institutional memory there of how to deal with changing economic conditions. I think they'll sail right on through. I think the bank is cheap enough and the dividend is high enough that it should do extremely well, pretty much no matter what happens in the economy uh, over the next uh, over the next few weeks and months. So that's kind of the wrap for today. I don't have a bunch more to talk about. Just wanted to jump on here and get a video done as the week is wrapping up. Markets have been kind of all over the place today. We opened down. Now we're up a little bit. Uh, we had a couple hundred points last time I bothered to take a look. Um, the geopolitical anxiety going into the weekend is probably going to be extreme. Depends what happens out of the Ukraine and what type of new and horrific stuff that we get to see unfold on national TV. Now, I got to say the NCAA tournament is here. Um, <laughs> I'm already blown up. My bracket is just an absolute disaster. Uh, uh, everybody took the shot, I think, on Kentucky with uh, little St. Peter's up there in Jersey City blowing away the Kentucky Wildcats. Um, that was interesting. We've got preseason baseball. Probably won't make it to a game this weekend, but it's not far off of my future where I'm going to sneak off and go catch a little live baseball for the first time in uh, well, it'll be over a couple of years now. I've been watching most of my games on TV because of the, our friend COVID. So anyway, that's where we're at, guys. Uh, if you need income, Angel Oaks Financial Strategies, community banks should be a big part of your portfolio. And I think that, you know, uh, in addition to the takeover oriented banks that we have in banking on profits, I think it's a good idea to consider adding low PE, uh, high dividend yield stocks to your longer term portfolio accounts. Uh, my retirement accounts, that's pretty much all that's in there these days. So anyway, guys, I'm Tim Melvin. Thanks for taking a few minutes to watch, to watch this video. And uh, I will be back next week uh, to see what the markets and the world are going to do. Thanks for watching.